The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. It's like your favorite call-in radio show, without being able to call in, and without being on the radio. Building HVAC Science with Bill Spohn. Welcome back to another episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Today we'll be speaking with Joe Medash. Joe's a good friend of mine. He's also one of the coolest guys I know, and he probably doesn't think of himself that way. He's been so influential in changing the minds, the perception and understanding of indoor air quality and healthy homes over the last few years. He's really taken everything he knows from his background and experience, and he's channeled it with so much passion about getting people to understand these complex topics. He's always testing products and building props and animations, and I don't know where he gets his boundless energy. If you get a chance, you want to go see Joe present sometime. Take a look in the show notes for LinkedIn connection and a link to the Hayward score, which is a really cool thing that Joe works with at this moment. This episode was recorded in December 2021. Now let's listen to Joe and my conversation about the art and science of healthy homes. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? I'm great, Bill. Thanks for having me on. Great. A lot of people know you, but a lot of people probably don't know you. And I want to make sure our listeners know a little bit about you. So give me some of your background going back to how you got involved with building science and health and IAQ. My original background is an artist. I went to the Art Institute of Chicago, which provided me what I would say the creativity and I focus on communication skills as an artist. So that's why I love talking with people or doing presentations. But my building science actually started as a home inspector and I went to a class and this guy talked about candles and seeing the impact in people's homes when the soot hit a cold surface. And then he went into this thing about Pascal's, which I'm like, what the heck's a Pascal? And how a hot water tank could backdraft over the slightest pressure. And from there, I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is not big sticks of wood and foundation stuff. This was the science. And from then on, I kept looking for more and more information and found great mentors to provide that. What time frame was that? Well, that was probably 2004, maybe five, something like that. What's your tie to science? I mean, like you really understand science well from what I can determine from talking with you all the time and you really investigate well. Do you have like a background in science or is it a hobby or something you're interested in as a growing up or anything? No, that's actually where the, again, the artist twist comes from. And people think of artists as people that are doing painting and like sculptures and stuff. But if we really look back on where artists have been in, in our history, let's go back to Renaissance. Let's go back. They were the architects. They were the scientists. They were the people discovering medical things about human bodies. They were the ones who really pushed science and we call them artists. So I kind of always been like a Renaissance kind of artist person that just apply yourself. And unfortunately, there's not a really word for that or somebody who's interested in how bodies work or how things work science-wise or building science-wise. But that's really my philosophy. A true artist is somebody who adapts himself to the environment that they're engaged in. That's really cool. That's a really cool definition. And I'm going to think of you differently now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've seen you produce various props and displays and exhibits. I mean, you've been at times a walking exhibit yourself several times. People may have run into you and wondered what's going on there. Why do you feel the need to do that? Do you think something's been missing or is it just your style? How is this coming about? It's because I'm into the visualization of understanding building science or the application of that, that it's sometimes an illustration may work better, but an animation even works best or Something that's trying to say, oh, you know what? It's now complete. It's brought together. Sometimes I need to do that for my own educational side. Like reading something sometimes doesn't like really complete it. So I will sometimes make animations or drawings to try to complete that. So, and I think that those are, I figured if I'm also looking for those types of next level of visualization or answers, probably somebody else is. So I should try to share that knowledge or share what I made and. I've had a few props that have been pretty successful in, in just trying to hammer home the concept of a picture is worth a thousand words and an actual prop is probably worth a small novel. Give me a couple examples of your prouder moments with props and illustrations, visualizations. Yeah, I made a prop probably eight years ago, maybe even nine years ago that I wanted to visualize what happens when we only use exhaust only ventilation and air out equals air in. So when air comes through the building envelope, I wanted to show, well, let's just 
remove the drywall and see what's inside the envelope and see what's going on there. And you can sometimes see infiltration by the fact that the fiberglass works as a filter in all of the soot that it's grabbing. And if you had some kind of rodent or other infestation, you could see that. And that's what we're breeding. So I created a little wall section. It's kind of equivalent to a one square foot concept. And then I put a tube and a mask on it. So that it's demonstrating that you're breathing through the envelope and try to hammer that home. And it'd be like, if this is okay by you, then now once you've seen it, the concept is you really have a hard time forgetting about it. So I thought that other contractors, I've had several people ask if I'd build another one. And I'm like, God, my time is so tight, but I clearly encourage you how to do it. I will tell you how to do it. Please go make one and show other people. It's just, it's not something I own. It's just something that I felt made a great visualization. I've never felt that I should profit all these things, but if somebody's complimenting me to want to make one, man, I'm like, let's make that happen. It'd be great if there's a place where you could just go buy these. Every contractor should have one when they show up to talk to the homeowner. That'd be pretty wild. Yeah. So we decided to talk today about another approach to IAQ, and you gave me this topic sentence. What can be learned by asking occupants about their homes, habits, and symptoms? Where does that whole concept come from? That comes from, I've been trying to stress to a lot of people that I have been blessed with having some great mentors in my life from the time I got out of art school and other people and some were like Colin Ginge was a great mentor in terms of not just airflow, but some other stuff he taught me about how to use a computer and stuff. And then I ran into Bill Hayward and we went to breakfast and he hired me before we had lunch. And I was just totally amazed by somebody who is so passionate about healthy homes and how the home can impact you. And him and his family were severely impacted by a home that they lived in that just had a nasty crawl space. And we keep thinking of mold, but wherever there's mold, there's bacteria. So those things actually caused them to almost lose two years of their life. And so Bill thought, uh, as many, like, well, maybe this happened to somebody else. What can I do to create a survey that would inform and gather information about what's happening to other occupants? And can we determine or educate people about, is your home impacting your health? And what can we do to give you advice to combat that, complete that, work with contractors? So in the beginning, there were some things that he had taught me that I was like, yeah, okay, like the occupant is always more accurate than any sensor. Your Ofra refactory is millions of times better than any device that anybody has. And that took me a while to really do that and to remind people to just trust what you smell, what you experience, what you feel, that gut feeling when you go into do a home assessment, let alone your own home, that once I really got that and embraced that, it changed what I thought about homes and who really knows their home better than anybody than the occupant. And sometimes they're doubtful themselves, right? Yeah. Someone who spends a lot of time there. In my mind, you sort of become the reviewer, the consumer reports of IAQ meters and devices. You do look at those in addition to this occupant basis. And by the way, that's the Hayward score, which I would encourage anyone listening to go take the Hayward score. And it's just H-A-Y-W-A-R-D score.com, correct? That's correct. Yeah. If you really do it well and take your time, you don't need to really run around and look at stuff in your house, just whatever you, it takes about anywhere from five to 10 minutes. And the ironic thing about it is that the people that give us feedback tell us how much they learned about their house by just taking the survey, which is probably around 80 to 100 questions, depending on one leads to another. And they keep, I learned so much about my house by just answering a bunch of questions about my house. So they started to visualize their house and making connections between not using the bathroom fan or doing other stuff and why some things may be happening in their house. That was kind of a surprise that just asking questions could lead to education. And I also found in my case, my wife and I took it, we had different scores. We had different expressions of things. And you talk about the occupant knows more, anything more accurate, but it is very personal. People do observe and react to things in different ways. Or want to admit that there's things in their home that they may not really want to admit to, to the right, even to themselves or to, especially on a survey that like, you know, no, 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 my home is well-maintained because they think they're admitting to somebody that they have a failure that they were not keeping up with what they should have. I bounced off that topic of IAQ meters. I want to bounce back into it. Thanks. Where did your interest come from that? And what's your process? Why do you do it? I was one of the first people to get uh, totally enthralled by the FUBOT. I think the FUBOT changed the fact that people were like, whoa, that I can plug that in and it's going to give me readings about what's in my environment. And I think that that was the thing that really changes. We met Jacques at many of the conferences that you and I had actually were attending together. And he was forthcoming about what he thought he could do. And there wasn't much competition. So the challenge was that we learned later that his device had a lot of anything new on the block may have something that's missing. And we found out that there were much better ways to measure that. But again, somebody has to start somewhere. 
So then I'm like, okay, what are some other devices that are out there? And you and I have had lots of conversations. You probably have been very, very challenged about how to bring stuff into True Tech tools that you felt were reasonably accurate at a reasonable price that could help others determine stuff. And it isn't until you get some of these devices and you're able to compare them to some others that you realize some of their shortcomings. And it may not just be their readings, but what they tell you on an app or do they have a dashboard? Do they reconnect after they lose power? Just a lot of simple things can create a real frustration for a homeowner. And they've been really, I describe them as they're not a blood test. They don't tell you everything you need to know, even about that environment that they're in let alone they can't tell you anything except where they're at. So people are like, oh yeah, what's going on in your house? I'm like, no, you can only tell what's going on, where that device is. And probably within about a 10 square foot area is really what you're capturing. So they've come a long way. I probably have around experienced 20 of them easily. I'm actually doing a test in my basement with a bunch of them right now. So what I've learned is that, and I get this from LBL confirmation, uh, Brett Singer is a good friend of both of ours, that he's gone on record. So I have this recording. I actually posted it. You can find it on YouTube. He says, you know what? The particulates and the carbon dioxide on many of the units that are out there are accurate enough to even really look at the numbers and compare. That We've gotten really good at sensors that are low-cost sensors. Again, your particulates and your carbon dioxide are worthy of looking at the number and the trends. I refer to them, I feel lucky to have been referred to as the trend indicator guy. Like I'm the one who focuses on this, just a trend indicator. It's not telling you real numbers, but you can compare two different devices with those things, particulates and carbon dioxide. And somehow integrate going back to the occupant feeling, the occupant reaction and integrate what's happening to the people with the trends you're seeing. I think what I hear you saying is like it's hard to set real high expectations for measurement precision. It's not like measuring an inch or a fraction of an inch. It's not like measuring temperature because even just the definitions of some of these things are so fuzzy. Like VOCs are volatile organic compounds with an S. So you're sensing a number of different compounds. What I've learned recently about VOCs, I'm still trying to figure this out. So VOCs are a completely different animal. And I don't know if I'm, you're never measuring one VOC. In fact, that's almost probably impossible. You're measuring this, not just multiples, but the, what they do to each other. And the home chem project is, we're learning lots of stuff about these things. And ozone itself impacts what's happening with these same kind of chemicals. But what I've learned about sensors is that what they're doing for VOCs is they have this electronic signature concepts that are they're saying, okay, I have this odor and I'm going to apply an electronic signature and get an electronic output is kind of how they're measuring VOCs. And so if I'm a sensor and I measure it, I say, oh, that's equal to 240. And you are a different type of sensor. And you say, no, that's 720 volts or millivolts back. So what I'm learning is that each one probably is fairly accurate in itself. It's just not really comparable. Again, talking to Brett at LBL, we think that the VOCs are like, until you get above big numbers like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, you probably don't have an impact unless you do. If you have a headache and you're trying to figure out what's that headache, I don't care what the number is. I need to figure out what it is and eliminate it. Can't eliminate it, then I need to dilute it or figure out a way to reduce it. So again, the occupant rules. Get a device to confirm that. But if you have a device that says, wow, your VOCs are so low, I can barely measure them. And they're like, it doesn't matter. I have a headache and I need to leave my house. They have a headache. You got to solve those things. And we don't acknowledge that they are just as important as what you're trying to tell them. Yeah. So the going back again to this other approach, the home survey through the Hayward score, really understanding and starting to think about your home in this ordered process when you answer the survey. I really like that. And I think I took part in both version one and version two. I'm not sure if it's evolved beyond that, but the version two is increasingly getting better in the way it guides you through that. The habits, that goes back to trends, things that you're doing differently. And that's where a meter may come in and help you highlight or observe or or recognize a trend that may be related to something you did, because it's all about how you drive your house, the things that you do within there. And then, of course, tying it back into the symptoms, like you just said, how are you feeling? Are there headaches? Are there other negative reactions that you're feeling? So we talk about the whole house. I think there's the whole process of IQ involves meters and people. It's got to be both. Right. And so I think one of the challenges for contractors that we're trained well and we're always learning about the house. So it's easy to go into a house. You can even use your olfactory factory yourselves and your senses and your eyes and everything to get an idea of what's happening and experience that yourselves. And we pull out these devices to try to measure it to confirm maybe what we're experiencing. Then we can document these numbers. But one of the things that we're not doing, I learned this from Carl Grimes, who works with Hayward Score, 
is how to use the occupant as a tool. So question is, is that, and you should be doing a really good history in terms of what do you know about the house and the occupant before you go roaming around. So I get some idea about where I should focus and what I'm looking for. But even before you go there or after you leave, you can ask the occupant because you really can't do it while you're there, but to do things like close all of the windows and doors everywhere and trying to get them to leave and going to a movie is tough now, but before the limitations to leaving your house. So go for a walk in a park. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> do something, take your dog. Then when you come back, focus on what are you experiencing? Go to one room, open the door slightly, put your head in. Is there something there that you sense is causing you? Go underneath the cabinets, open the cabinet real quick, look in, smell. I think there's something that the occupant can do to actually help their own cause when they have their own sensitivities. Those are just some simple ways to do that is to isolate the house as best you can and get them to open every cabinet, every area and see if there's something happening. And as soon as they have it in one area, it's kind of hard to go to the next. So it could be a multi-process. You may find that multiple rooms have something. But again, trying to educate the client and use them as a tool. Now you can come back and focus yourself on those same areas and help them determine like, why do you have all these nasty chemicals underneath the sink here? Let's look at what do you need and not need. Maybe some of these need to go in the garage. Right. Another place to store them. Sure. Or just get rid of them. Yeah, right. So that's where you can change people's habits where they now realize that they're, I get a lot of calls and so does Carl about people that are just devastated by their house and they struggle to figure out what's happening. I would consider you pretty prolific for the amount of work, presentations, seminars, things that you've done. Can you give us kind of a list of them? I'll just throw out one out there. You tend to be a recurring visitor to the Energy Circle webinars to give an IEQ update. So things that I, I feel like I am trying to do is change the dialogue about how energy efficiency really is actually health benefits. In fact, that's why I left. I was at RetroTech for a long time and learned about pressure mapping and pressure issues and ways to use your tools differently and that kind of stuff. And then one day it just dawned on me. I'm like, again, I tell people like saving energy is a waste of energy. It, it takes 43 people and so many hours and a bunch of stuff to save 17 watts and maybe $8 for an average home. Maybe it's more. It could be $43, which could be a lot of money for a low-income house. I understand those things. But the amount of things you save probably in terms of like uh, days off work, days off school, the money they spend on medication, the impact of their lives, comfort. We now know that these things also impact respiratory issues and heart conditions. <laughs> that is some serious benefits from doing energy retrofit. I mean, that's just simple air sealing, thermal upgrades, and HVAC tune-up, not replacement, just a tune-up. Well-documented the benefits that come from that. But we focus on the fact that it saves somebody $12. So I'm like, that's great. But we are just afraid to actually talk about the other stuff that are just massive benefits. So that's really how I switch from energy. And Kevin Kennedy and I do a lot of great sessions on energy efficiency and healthy homes at the same time and show this stuff. So it's no longer infiltration, which is an awkward word. It's actually contaminant pathway. And Kevin likes to use exposure pathway. So, okay. So the blower door is actually an exposure pathway measurement device. It's telling you where your exposures are coming from. You can determine if this is the attic or the crawl space or the garage with a blower door and stop thinking about that it's an energy loss. There's much worse issues in that crawl space in that garage than there is energy benefit. So when we started thinking about that and changing our terminology, we now have a much better chance of improving people's lives. And there's even some curriculum you've helped to write? If you don't know Kevin Kennedy, who's at the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, please don't hesitate to look him up or reach out because he's been a major, we talk about mentors, he's just been a great friend and influencer in a lot of stuff that I do. So I was able to work with him and Larry Zarker and a few others trying to create the HHE. And together we produced the first curriculum for the Healthy Home Evaluator the BPI has. But I met Kevin at Habitat X conference kind of thing that was in Kansas City and he was a speaker. Again, like I said, when I saw the thing about the candles and the soot, instantly I'm like, oh my God, I've got to follow this guy. I've got to get connected. So I did everything I could to connect with him and do more things. And eventually we started doing workshops together and he respected my knowledge of pressure boundary and the things we do in a house. And he clearly comes from the aspect of how do these things impact people in general. So together we actually made a good team and we still do. Is there any place people can get access to your work? Do you have any websites or look your name up and see the webinars you've done out there? You can go to YouTube and Google Joe Madosh and you'll see a bunch of stuff I did with Retrotech. I do have some of my own stuff I've been putting up on YouTube. It is my goal to try and take some of the presentations, which you only get to see if you're in the room and use those recordings or re-record them and get them up. But I'm not a self-promoter, unfortunately. I'm just, I'm happy to be able to do it. But 
You're not going to find me on Facebook, really. You don't find me on the social media. I felt as though if I was looked back on years later, that they'd be like, ah, somehow he avoided social media is how I look at it. <laughs> you did go to Brian Orr's symposium? Yeah, there's been two of them now, and I've been to both of those, and I always present. Brian Orr is also a, just a phenomenal resource. Why don't you plug Brian real quick? I know he's a good friend of both of us. Yeah, absolutely. Brian just, I don't want to say he came out of nowhere. He came out of, <laughs> like, he was an overnight success in 15 years, but he started doing this thing called HVACRschool.com. I want to say around 2015, 2016. It's now built into this minor media empire for HVAC, attracting all kinds of good talent, good experts, great conversations, podcasts, videos. This symposium we mentioned, that's something else to look up. If you're a listener, you're not aware of that, take a look at the offerings that will be held in February of 2022 is the next one. If you go to hvacrschool.com slash events, I think with a plural S and events, you should find the link to that symposium. And then just all the tons of other resources there. And Brian focuses on HVAC, but he engages with building performance. He engages with IAQ, really, I think, helps move the dialogue forward for practitioners, for people who can really make a difference in people's lives. A lot of my great connections with people come from the strangest thing. So I'm actually on the phone with Bill Spohn here saying, hey, Bill, what's going on? He goes, hey, where are you? I'm like, oh, I'm down in Florida to do some training, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, man, have you met Brian Orr? I'm like, no, who's Brian Orr? He goes, hold on. And he calls Brian Orr and they say, hey, I got my friend Joe Medosh. And Brian's like, oh, well, where is he? Let's go meet within 30 minutes. I'm at a restaurant and Brian Orr is there. And that's just the kind of people that I've been blessed with, like you, Bill, and Brian and others that you're willing to help people make connections and want to make the industry better. It's been like, wow, what a great group to keep stumbling into. So Brian's also, he's an amazing guy. You definitely need to look him up and connect with him. But the symposium allowed me to do some IEQ stuff. And I don't get the big draw of the Jim Bergman packed house stuff, but I do get a bunch of people that want to understand that the future of HVAC is more than just swapping the box. And it is filtration and it is ventilation and it is a variety of stuff. So he is open to those types of sessions and wants to promote that. What would you say is the most misunderstood topic or concept that you run across where you have to feel like you have to keep repeating yourself? Number one, mold. So mold is the visible condition of a moisture issue. That's really what it is. And if we, there's a difference of like vapor moisture or bulk moisture, either one of those has their own source, right? So vapor is the hardest one to really figure out. But if you just think mold, 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 you're like, no, no, no. Find the problem to eliminate the mold. And the other part of mold is that it must be removed from the house. You cannot just kill it or please don't spray bleach on it. That's not what you need to do. Wash it off with soap and water and remove it. Now, if you have something that is a catastrophic water infiltration issue, you should hire a professional because you could really make a mess of your house. So those are things that I've learned years and years ago. And actually in Arizona, which has a dry climate, and a lot of people have mold issues because they have water inside their house. And the other is, what is indoor air quality in general? Or I want to get my home tested. I want to have somebody come out and test my air. Really what they're mostly asking for is, I want a mold test. I want to find out if I have mold in my house. Most people are not savvy enough to be like, oh, I have all these nasty odors. I want somebody to come test them or my particulates are high, I'm coughing a lot, I want to get an indoor air quality test. It's usually, oh, I want to get my indoor air quality tested, usually because they think they have a mold issue. So those things are really mixed up as a concept of what's an indoor air quality test. We work with Peter Trost, who has lots of contractors and documents these things on Google searches as to the confusion that happens out there. That So many people want to have their air tested, but what are they tested for? And I talk with Eric from True Tech Tools a lot. He's like, yeah, I get this question all the time, but what do you want to test for? What do you want to test? And there's just so many variables that go along with that. So you even got to back that up to the why. Why are you even interested in this? Why did you make a call to do this? Yeah, right. And that's where actually Hayward Score comes into play. So Hayward Score is this survey, but we were using Google AdWords and our marketing strategy was, is your home impacting your health? And the people that their home was impacting them were reaching out to us or finding our survey. So the high majority of people that took our survey had an issue in their house. It could have been mold. It could have been something happening or a combination. But in general, they were looking for a solution and they've already exhausted all other resources and continued to Google until they stumbled into us. And they're like, hey, it's a free survey. It can't hurt. I will take this. And many people found that it was very beneficial. And we have lots of great documents to help them or figure that out or how to clean up. 
their moisture issue, which is now visible mold. So we try to come up with a lot of stuff to educate them for all for free to do this. But we weren't getting regular people to take our survey. So it imbalanced our data until we just reached out to the survey monkey and said, okay, let's redo this with them so we could make our data comparable. But in general, a high majority of our people already had an impact. They couldn't find anybody. Contractors didn't get it. Or one contractor said, oh, it's this thing. Let's just put in some weird thing to your HVAC system that they thought would be a solution or do this. But nobody really understood them or spent the time. And most people say they're crazy or they are too difficult to work with. And I understand why they could think that, but many of them have the funds to want to fix it. They want to live healthier. And moving isn't an answer because the next house could have the same issue. They just want to live without having a body burden. I can't fathom. I feel for those people that have that. It just must be so exhausting mentally and physically if you have those kind of conditions. Speaking of that, are there any things you'd want to share with us, like personal impact or any kind of personal changes you've made as you've gone through this spectrum of learning over the years? Yeah, I do respect the fact that simple things like taking your shoes off at the door, it's just simple stuff. The majority of the particulates, allergens come in through us, like probably anywhere from 40 to 60% and actually walk in with you and stay on you and are on your jackets and your shoes. And as you take all this stuff off, you're just spreading that stuff around. Some of it does come through infiltration or pathways. But in general, I just have been more aware of how our homes get impacted by us. I've always used an exhaust fan, but never really understood what it was doing or where did the air come from that when I turned that on, those kind of things. Unfortunately, my family's never had the convenience of having the car in the garage. We just, I always had a shop and tools and stuff. So our cars always stayed in the garage, which is incredibly healthy. If you want to do one thing, stop parking your car in the garage. Those things are- Oh, the catch garage. Attached garage. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you have a detached garage that you're definitely blessed, but yeah, parking your car in your garage can have, we describe it as it's, if it's in the garage, it's in your house. There's a major connection between your house, not just that door, but all the other pathways, even through the attic, back through your house, the walls themselves, all that is well connected. All the connections inside the walls. Yeah. Ceilings, chases. That footprint. Yeah. yeah, The chases all across the bottom of the garage, all that stuff. So in the garage, cars just are nasty. So that was kind of an indirect benefit of not putting cars in our house. So in the attached garage. If you've been doing this, you talked about 2004, you kind of like your boom, the firecracker went off in your mind. And we're 17 years later. I imagine you have seen some more or less successful business models for actually engaging and providing solutions for people. I think you're more in the training and information content providing basis, but how about business models? Have you seen any successful ones? Like someone you could think of, you don't have to say their name. You could say their name if you like. Well, no, I'm okay with that. Keith O'Hara is somebody that I admire a lot. Keith O'Hara is out in the San Francisco area and he'll only do the job if they want to do the whole house or what he's proposing. So he proposes redoing the attic in terms of air sealing. Let's try and get the ducts in conditioned space whenever possible. He's installing a full ventilation system. So when he's done, he's changing those people's lives in terms of how they breathe and how they experience a good airtight thermal boundary home that has great ventilation. And that's just what he does. We've talked about home performance contractors a lot in less many years, and we all thought this would take off or more HVAC groups would become home performance contractors, and they didn't. Rob Minnick is a good example of somebody who is HVAC and said, you know what, we can do more by providing some of these services. So I think there's maybe around 20. Maybe they'll make comments on your thing like, no, I'm here too. But in general, if there was 50 home performance contractors across the country, I would be surprised, even though everybody's trying to encourage them or help them or get to that. But it's really a challenge to be multidisciplined at a house that you can actually, usually they can do the envelope, but not only everybody can do the HVAC. So there's always these things that are always a challenge for any one contractor to want to take on that type of responsibility. And some of these, costs. You're saying here, I think the cheapest you could probably get away with is around 15 to 18 grand to do those kind of homes. Most of them are probably around 30 to 40 grand if you're doing that. And these are average homeowners who have accepted that, you know what, I need to do this to my house. And ironically, there's no granite to look at. There's no beautiful bathroom to look at. It's only what you're breathing and experiencing. That's a hard sell for a lot of contractors that your client has nothing to look at. Except maybe their bill went down, but that's tough. So yeah, I mean, Nate Adams was doing that for a while and then the utilities put him out of business because they would 
offer people to do cheap stuff and get free rebates. And he had to switch his concept as to, I'll do this. And I don't know if he only takes on a handful of clients a year just because he's also dedicated to, let's do it. Let's do it right. If you don't want to do that, then you're not the client I should work with. And that's hard for a lot of contractors to be like, you know what? There's other fish that I should be- To turn down customers. Yeah. yeah. Are there any myths or misconceptions about- indoor air quality, healthy homes you'd like to dispel to make sure people, if they're listening to this, they walk away with something like, definitely, you got to know this. A couple of basic ones, like all homes have mold spores. They're on us. They're everywhere. If I want to come into your home, I could clearly find mold spores with some silly test, air sampling test. God help you if people are doing these surface sample tests and telling you have a mold problem. So in general, make sure you get informed by people who are in the industry and have certifications about if you have concerns about mold. And mold can be devastating to people. That's what actually impacted Bill and his family. Not to make light of it, but mold doesn't pick you to attack. It's everywhere anyway. Yeah. And be cautious about where you're getting your information from. There's a lot of people on YouTube and Facebook that may give you information. If you believe you have mold in your body or whatever, there's a lot of things that are actually saying that some of that really comes from food, from moldy food, even though you can't, it doesn't look moldy, you know, a lot of breads and other stuff, grains, all those things could have that kind of stuff that gets in your blood. So just make sure you're finding multiple resources to confirm your concerns. Be selective about what you're putting in your house. That We put in a lot of nasty stuff. Cheap carpet does not improve your indoor air quality in any way. So there's just a lot of great resources out there now from Environmental Working Group, EWG, Healthy Building Network, for those who are in the industry, they provide a lot of great resources about materials you should be using. I think we're just now headed towards healthy product declarations that are happening for some builders or some manufacturers to want to disclose what's in theirs. The Red List and a Living Building Future is a great resource in terms of some of that. Commercial buildings, the well, the well fit, they're embracing what's happening. It's kind of like what happens in space eventually happens to us in our homes. And what's happening in commercial buildings is slowly working their way down to residential. Things don't happen quickly, but I think they are headed that way, that you can now think more about what am I putting in my home? What am I building my house out of? And make better solutions that you don't have to then mitigate later because your home has challenges or odors. But my one soapbox that I get on regularly is we now are required to do ventilation. It's part of the code. If you have an existing home, then you probably just, you have ventilation. You don't know what it's called, a fart fan. So excuse my language, but that's just really what we think of it. It's just a small bathroom fan. Yeah. It doesn't do a lot. It, it sometimes it even struggles to work with the moisture that's in that room. And now we have code required ventilation, which is just another bathroom fan, or that bathroom fan stays on for uh, 24-7. It's quiet. It does its job, but that's not ventilation. Ventilation is something that should be able to grab air from different parts of the house and bring air in from outside and exchange that. And if you're not getting a real exchange of outdoor air, because it's not fresh, it's just outdoor air in exchange for what you have inside, then you really don't have ventilation. And that's just, I think, the saddest thing about our industry is we're so sophisticated. We have really phenomenal products to build a house out of. I mean, like you can take sawdust and make it into a piece of wood now and just weird stuff. Again, it has a lot of nasty chemicals, but we still don't embrace that ventilation is just as important as a good foundation. And I just really feel as though that's not good. It's not solid building science until you actually have completed that as a concept. And opening windows is a great solution. I will give you that. There are ways you can do it with it. You don't need an entire full-blown system. You can actually do it with a variety of stuff, but some areas where you live can have high particulates built out in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh area and other places it's incredibly cold. But again, ventilation is our greatest weakness that we have in homes. You just said you were going to be on your soapbox. Is your soapbox emitting VOCs or particulates? No, it is actually made of natural fibrous materials from outside. In fact, I got it from my own backyard. So Very good. Okay. I am proud of you. All natural soap. Even more proud of you. Yeah. So let's shift back to a little topic we had near the beginning. We talked about particulates, CO2, VOCs. Let's be really specific in terms of what is measured, why it's important, and the quantities of measurement. So people, they understand, is it PPB? Is it PPM? What are we looking at? And why are these important? I would think that anything that I would say, people would forget by the time the podcast was over, just to be honest, right? So I say, oh, well, if it's above 12 PPM or PPB, right? Oh, no, not like that. It's just like particulates are measured in X and they're important because they do that to your body. If we just talk about particulates, the PM, let's just go through 
That means particulate measurement? So yes, particulate mass, actually, PPM. Very good. Thank you. And 2.5 is the size of the mass. And these are fractions of a fraction of an inch. They're by no means visible in any way. 2.5 microns. Microns, that's right. So when people refer to uh, PM 2.5, they're talking about particles that are super small. And there's other ones that are PM5, PM10. Those are thought of as larger. Think about five or the things that you're, when you breathe in, your nose would actually grab. PM5 will probably get caught maybe in your throat. But PM2.5 is getting through your nose, down your throat, and headed towards your lungs. And things that are PM2.5 and smaller, now we're talking PM1 even. PM1, PM0.5, 0.3, those are getting deep into your lungs. And even PM2.5 can many times, I've now moved through the ovuli in my lungs into my blood system. So now, these particulates that I'm breathing are going through my lungs into my blood. And now they go to your brain, your heart, all of your organs, and now are impacting that. We in America are truly blessed with great outdoor air. You may not think that where you live or you're listening to me, but if you go to India or China or other places, they are off the charts with numbers. And they also are reason why we understand that PM2.5 is just the standard number that we use as a comparison is causing heart disease, heart conditions, and other organ failures and problems because they are showing these things that have issues and they're not showing anything else that could directly cause them or they may be an additive cause. But we now know that these things are happening because of other countries that have such bad indoor air quality. Yeah, there's some studies I remember reading as PM outdoor levels increase, the amount of emergency room admissions for heart attacks increases. And there's there's just like no denying there's some kind of correlation there. Even in America, we are able to document those. And we know that there are hundreds of thousands of deaths that are related to PM. So PM is, back to a, a different soapbox, it would be particulate, particulates, particulates. They are one of the greatest risks for us and also one of the easiest things to combat in a house. That if you really just wanted to reduce your particulate matter, you would have a fairly good airtight home. Of course, we need ventilation, but you could do a great filtration system, which for most areas, you're using a fair enough amount to do that. Maybe you supplement it with a standalone unit, but we can now grab those and throw them away. So there is a way, again, HVAC contractor shows up to do an assessment. He can increase their filtration right then, right there, make sure they have low static. I think that's just one of the greatest things we're not doing right now is making sure filtration and now we're on this, remember, we forgot, COVID's still here. Okay, So whenever you're listening to it, COVID is very active and we're on the Omicron, Nonocron, whatever type of variant is now happening. And people don't think that, oh, this captures viruses. And I'm like, well, I really want to see your data because viruses are just, if we're talking about PM2.5 being small, viruses are just beyond small. Yeah, I think it's 0.5. Yeah, they, they don't travel around really the way we think. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of viruses in the air. They grab onto bigger things like PM2.5 or PM5 and 10. So they're like, hey, free ride, I'm attaching to you. So it's easy to filter those types of things out. And you then are also filtering out these viruses that are in your air. So that if you really want to capture stuff. Now, real quick on filtration, that one of the things that still is a mystery to science in general, like indoor air quality, is the size is 2.5, it's 3.0, 3.0 microns. For some reason, it is able to work its way through a lot of different filter systems that for somehow it's hard to capture, it's hard to grab. 10 is big and it gets caught. Uh, 0.3 is small and it gets caught. But for some reason, 3, that's why 2.5 is this number, it's really challenging to capture it in some filtration system. So when you're looking at something, that's the comparable number. How well does it do at 3.0? In some senses now, we're like, hey, let's take advantage of that. We capture much smaller stuff. I'm like, well, everybody does. So if you're looking at marketing information now, they were like, somebody was really creative, like, oh, we capture down to 0.1 and smaller. I'm like, well, great, because everybody does. It's how well do you capture at three? There's like four ways that filters work. It's like the sieve effect, like you'd think like a pasta strainer. I like believe it's electrostatics. There's Brownian motion. And there's even another force. A pretty intense science that goes on in filters. And the fact that if they're done well, they're random. It's it's a random mesh. That's the whole concept. You don't want something that's like a cloth because then it, fi- it easily finds its way through. So. It's a media. Well, wait, I'll finish one more part of that real quick. And that is that we know about particulates, but carbon dioxide is not a federal issue. And in terms of like for particulates, we have these federal mandates that so outside can't shouldn't exceed and we want to control. And even in your home, you're trying to control these levels. It is actually a federal regulated condition. 
For outdoor air quality, yeah. Yeah, right. They don't regulate indoor air quality because we just don't do that, unless it's a commercial application. But for carbon dioxide, it's not considered a hazard. It's just not known to be a hazard. So there's no federal mandate that you have to have your home or any environment below that. We have guidance, but there's nothing. So there is a UL standard that just was released on sensors for particulates. It'll be out. It's released, but it's now going to be integrated as a test method. It may take another year or two to be there, but soon all sensors have the ability to be UL approved or UL standard. And HVI is trying to embrace that as a, a body that could standardize these devices for the first time. Next is carbon dioxide, but there's no federal monitor that you could use. You have to use something that's equivalent, but there's a federal monitor that you can use or equivalent for particulates, not exactly for carbon dioxide. And VOCs is just a whole other animal. My earlier exposure to carbon dioxide in terms of air quality, indoor air quality, is it's a good indicator how fresh the air is because if air isn't turning over, your people inside are exhaling it, they're doing other activities and the levels are going up. It usually comes from human sources. Is that correct? That's the way you see it? So yeah, it is able to determine. It's described as a way of indirectly determining your ventilation rate or how good the air is inside. So yeah. How fast that builds up. And the impact of CO2 is, I think, the more recently, more and more studies about cognition and learning and sick days and things like that. It's not directly a poison, but it's not great when it builds up in your atmosphere. Yeah, right. And there's been many studies that show that even they created the environment to do that. They actually were increasing the carbon dioxide while people were doing cognitive studies. And you get on an airplane and you wonder why you get tired or you're yawning. It's because that carbon dioxide level is much more than you experience in any other place. And usually it's around 1,800 to maybe sometimes 2,200. And normally you're trying to keep stuff below 800 in your room. So I think if you're really looking for anything that would actually give you good information about your house, it's to get a monitor and just focus on particulates and carbon dioxide. And if you want to know where to put it, put it in your bedroom, because that'll tell you how well you're sleeping at night, what was your carbon dioxide levels while you were sleeping, because two people in a bedroom with a door closed, those numbers could go up pretty quickly. And you may find that, yeah, I probably should figure out a way to reduce that. Opening your bedroom door is the first one. The second is cracking a window. And third is I need a ventilation system. And there's a group that's doing a study actually in the Pittsburgh area called ROCIS, R-O-C-I-S dot O-R-G. They've been doing studies with different monitors given to average people who monitor their homes for a three-week period of time. And you can look at anyone listening, can look at some of those studies there. And not quite scientific studies, but more like citizen science. So it's a real world. It wouldn't diminish that. You said that in a way that we are trying to change people's minds that when you've got as many people as she does using calibrated devices in their own home, that those studies are, most people are lucky to get 30 or 40 people. She's got hundreds of people giving us data. She's, it's phenomenal. Absolutely. The scientists who volunteer their time to review the data, that's also important. But see, they're also using that data and they're fixing homes and then confirming that the fix is actually accredited to that. So they're doing filter upgrades in their HVAC system and changing the motor so they can run continuously. And her data can tell you when you should close your windows because they're monitoring indoor and outdoor conditions. So that's pretty phenomenal that you could actually send out an alert telling people, hey, you know what? Our outdoor monitors are telling people that the wind has shifted. It's time to close your windows. The champion behind that is Linda Wigington, who's been in the home performance industry for decades. And it's rocis.org, Reduction of Outdoor Contaminants in Indoor Spaces.org. They also have a Facebook page for people, unlike Joe, who are on Facebook. Yeah, she's a great resource, and I consider her a friend. And we presented together in multiple places. And if you're in that area, you should get to know her. And she does do a few things for people that are outside the area. But if you want to see what she's doing, you can do it yourself with her. The devices aren't that expensive, really. And another good resource on a continuing basis is Joe Hughes and Chris Slotnick. You want to talk about them? Joe Hughes and Chris Slotnick? Yeah, we're hashing their names. Right, 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 right. The IAQ radio show happens every Friday at noon. And they also have show have their back shows. And anybody who's anybody has been on this show. And they talk about all kinds of conditions in the home. And they both come from mold assessments and remediation. And they have changed the industry on many levels. So if you're really looking for some great resources, that's one. And another great resource is uh, Bob Krell at Healthy Indoors. He has a magazine. He has a show. It'll come back early in January. I am sometimes the intermittent co-host of that. 
And Bob is also somebody who's been in the remediation and duct cleaning industry for years and promotes free information. His magazine is free. You can either download it online or you can even have it mailed out for free. Again, somebody who's been a major influencer in terms of what we should be doing and how to educate others. Again, there's just so many great resources that don't cost anything. Yeah. IAQRadio.com is the first one with Joe and Cliff. And then Bob is HealthyIndoors.com. Oh, you said Chris. It was Cliff. I'm I know. Sorry, it is right. Cliff. Yeah. He's the Z-Man. I should just call him by his right, name. Right. The Z-Man. Z-Man. That would yeah, have right. been the absolute easy way to do it. I feel like we covered a lot. Don't just it's a topic. Don't want to keep our listeners away from their ears for too long. Joe, any closing thoughts you'd like to share? I just feel like I have been, as I said, probably many times, really lucky and blessed to have some great mentors and good friends. And I know that some people probably do that. And I've done it many times and you're like, no, Joe, it's okay. So I think that you're somebody who I admire a lot in terms of what you give back. We talked about a lot of people that give back. I just admire all things you do for our industry, Bill. And there's so many ways that you give. And I can't believe the amount of stuff that you've all been able to pull off from podcast to this and training. And I go to a conference to do a session and you've got one too. So I just want to say kudos to you and many people who are listening. Just say thanks for all you've given back to our industry. Appreciate it. And appreciate you coming on today, record this. And my objective is to get people to think differently about a variety of different topics. And I think you've provided a lot of food for thought in this conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for listening in to this conversation with Joe Madash and I just recorded in December, 2021, where we talked about the art and science of healthy homes. The Building HVC Science Podcast is a production of True Tech Tools Limited. And the concepts for it usually come from things popping out of my head. So this is Bill Spohn, your host, signing off now. Until next time in the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Take care.